So uh, welcome back. Um, uh, so uh, one of you stole uh, the well borrowed the English the English version. Uh, so now I, I I've not been able to find a read French, but not as well as I, I used to. Uh, it turns out uh, there's a very special relationship between our next speaker and Yvonne Choquebrouha, and in her memoir she uh, uh, she speaks very affectionately. Of, uh, of Sergio Kleinermann. So Sergio Kleinermann is a man of high standards as well. And uh, when I was a graduate student, I, you know, there was a sense uh, of me or a, a picture that had formed in me when, when speaker people spoke of Sergio Kleinermann, it was often very differential. And I, I thought, oh, you know, this is a man who, who can be very strict. And, uh, uh, but then it turns out there is a, there's a person that's connecting Sergio Kleinermann and me personally and uh, a, a very close friend uh, who passed away in 2007. That's his older field. Uh, so she had ran the math department at Stanford yeah. uh, for 50 years. And, uh, and in those 50 years, she, she had become the living memory of uh, the Stanford mathematics department. And uh, she, she had... Uh, many gifts and, and, and many contributions she's, uh, she made to the graduate students. And one of them was to tell stories um, of, of the people who had walked in and out of the Stanford Math Department and uh, stories of people, stories of colleagues, stories of, you know, professional behavior and, uh, and kindness and collaboration. That was very important for me to form an idea of what a scientist could be. And uh, uh, with Sergio Kleinermann, uh, Sergi would never come to Stanford in these days without flowers for his older field. <laughs> he he wouldn't. And then I thought, oh, <laughs> maybe 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 there is even much more to Sergio. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, it's anyway my very great uh, pleasure to introduce Sergio Kleinerman from Princeton University, who is co uh, going to tell us about mathematical GR seventy two years after the foundational paper of Yvonne Jokebruha in Acta Mathematica. Sergio, it's a pleasure having you. Thank you a lot, uh, Mike. And my, my wife would be very happy to hear what you said. <laughs> uh, she complains that she doesn't get enough love. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, first of all, thank you, Piotr and, and Michael, for organizing this conference. It's uh, Yvonne, and of course, all the other organizers. Uh, Yvonne uh, is a very dear person to me. She's a, she has been a model of uh, a scientist. Uh, terms of scientific standards and integrity. Uh, and uh, it's too bad that she cannot be here. But uh, I'm very glad that all of us are, are paying this tribute to her. Uh, in fact, I, I decided to really try to talk a little bit, try to connect what is happening today in Mathematical GR with, with her Yvonne, the foundational work of Yvonne, uh, the, famous ACTA 1952 papers. Uh, so here is a little bit the, the plan of the talk. So uh, obviously I, I want to talk about uh, the ACTA paper. Uh, I want to point out that there is a, a, a paper by Christo Dulu, uh, which appeared in 2022, uh, which describes more in details uh, the work of Simon Chogadua. Uh, then I'll talk a, a little bit about things which are connected with uh, uh, her method. Uh, many, few people know, I didn't know until actually I, I had to use the Skirchhoff Sobole formula. Few people know that uh, the, her paper is not based on energy estimates as most papers nowadays in, in hyperbolic equations. Uh, it's actually based on the so called Kirchhoff Sobole formula. And um, so I'll try to talk about it and talk about uh, results <coughs> which followed also using Kirchhoff Sobole formula. I, I, I think it's it's a, these are physical space formulas which uh, uh, have not been paid too much attention in at least in recent years. Uh, I'll talk about uh, then about the energy method, talk about a little bit about the bounded L2 theorem, which is uh, the sort of the optimal that one can get in terms of, uh, of a local existence theorem. Uh, uh, so here is a Kirchhoff Sobolev and the breakdown criterion. Uh, the vector field method, null condition, and stability of Minkowski. Of course, I'll talk very shortly about each one of them. I, I, I really uh, I apologize from the beginning that, that obviously I'm not going to talk about all of uh, mathematical general relativity, but only things which are 
connected uh, somehow with uh, the Yvonne's paper, uh, but also, of course, with my own interests. Uh, so I'll talk about other nonlinear global stability results. There are now lots of them, so I'll, I'll try to pay tribute to, to some at least. Uh, talk about formation of trapped surfaces, uh, instability of naked singularity. This is something to do with cosmic censorship. Her stability a little bit uh, as much as I have the time. Of course, uh, Jeremy will continue uh, with a lot more. Uh, instability of the Cauchy horizon, rigidity for smooth stationary solutions. Obviously, I will not be able to talk about all these topics, but at least I wanted to mention them. Uh, so here is, of course, the Einstein uh, equations, the vacuum equations. Uh, Yvonne's ACTA paper talks about, about the, the, the vacuum equations. Uh, of course, uh, the, her work is intimately tied to the so-called wave coordinates. She calls them isothermal coordinates. They were actually introduced very early on by the Donder and Lanchos, 1921 and 1922. Of course, Einstein had it in the linear setting um, in his derivation of gravitational waves. Uh, uh, this is how the equations look like. So it's a quasi-linear system of uh, hyperbolic equations. Uh, initial data sets, of course, uh, Yvonne has also done a lot of work on this, but I'm not going to touch uh, that part. I talk most, mostly about the evolution, essentially only about the evolution problem. Uh, and of course, there is a famous uh, Yvonne choquet brouard Geroch result, uh, which associates to any initial data set a, a unique maximal future global hyperbolic development. And as a consequence, essentially all of uh, mathematical general relativity could be said to be included in, in sort of understanding this uh, uh, global property of the maximal uh, future global hyperbolic development associated with the in, in, in initial data set. So in fact, there are two parts of mathematical general relativity. The one that has to do with the constraint equations, which is very rich and we heard a lot about it. And the other one that has to do with the evolution problem. Uh, so here is a, uh, the, the work of, of, of Yvonne that we admire so much. There is a, a first, uh, when she was still a student, uh, there was a Contrand U paper in February of 1950, which is presented by Adamar. This was really uh, probably the greatest uh, living mathematician at the time, uh, who was so much interested in her work. So she started very well, I should say. Uh, and then she had the Acta Mathematica paper in 1952, which is a long paper. This was just a few pages. Uh, so this is uh, the paper uh, that uh, we all know and admire. So uh, she proves, uh, so what, what she does in this paper is, is to prove a local existence and uniqueness result for second order hyperbolic systems. And as I mentioned earlier, is based on uh, a kirchhoff sobolev type form representation formula. I'll say, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll obviously try to tell you what that is. And uh, and then uh, so this is a very general uh, study of uh, nonlinear hyperbolic <coughs> no, system of uh, second order wave equations, uh, and uh, with application then in for the Einstein vacuum equation in wave coordinates, uh, and uh, the result is not a very good result from uh, standards of today. Uh, she requires five derivatives of the metric and four of the second fundamental form in order to prove existence. Uh, so let me talk about the uh, Kirchhoff formula in the simplest possible setting. And of course, everybody knows what uh, Kirchhoff formula is for the wave equations in Nikopsky space. So this is in three plus one dimensions. Uh, so, uh, and you, you take a point P, uh, you, you, you want to represent the solution at the point P in terms of, uh, so this is an Alcon initiating at P going all the way to the initial data. Uh, and uh, you are integrating uh, this function f. So I assume that the data is zero here and then I'm, I'm looking at uh, the inhomogeneous problem. Uh, and there is a w here, an, an integral over the light cone uh, from p uh, and the w, which uh, turns out to be just x minus x bar to the minus one. So uh, we we'll see it in a moment how it shows up. Uh, so how do you get this formula? <laughs> of course, there are many, many derivations, but the, the derivation which is very relevant to uh, to this kirchhoff sobolev is the one in which I look for specific solutions of the form W times delta of U. So delta is a Dirac mass 
Uh, so this is uh, a pullback uh, by U of, uh, of a Dirac mass at, at, at point zero. And uh, when you calculate, you get, uh, you get sort of a very simple uh, formula in which uh, on one hand you get second derivative of delta, uh, first derivative of delta, and zero derivative of delta. And uh, obviously you don't like this term, you don't like this term, uh, you want to make them zero and uh, you do them by solving the iconal equation. So in order to get rid of this, so U will be a solution of the iconal equation intimately tied to this N minus P. In other words, U is going to be exactly the, the uh, solution uh, of the iconal equation corresponding such that U equal to zero, the level surface U equal to zero is exactly N, N minus P. And uh, and then uh, in order to kill the second term, you need a transport equation, which uh, uh, is expressed like this. So you see minus two L, L is a geodesic vector field associated to U. Uh, so it's a it's a generator along the this now hyper surface, and you have to solve a transport equation like this. Uh, so you 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 solve the transport equation, and you are left to this term. Now, when you solve the transport equation, you get exactly this uh, this formula. Uh, you plug it in here, and in fact, for some reason, I don't see I don't see the whole the whole page. Maybe I should. Yeah, it's too bad. Uh, there is. Uh, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, anyway, what what you see uh, at the end of the day uh, for for exactly this W, you see that this gives you exactly the, the delta function. So in the end, uh, you get uh, you get this formula of W given by this. Okay, so that's a Kirchhoff formula. Now you you want to generalize it uh, to curve space time. So imagine that you have a Lorentzian metric. You have again at point P on the manifold. Uh, you take the uh, the path of the point and the the boundary of the path, which you call n minus uh, p. You take L just like before, an algebraic generator along the boundary. You find the second fundamental form uh, for two vector fields x and y. It's uh, it's an L second fundamental form, the usual thing. Uh, you have of course a J Jacobi equation, which is uh, DL, the derivative uh, long L of chi plus chi squared is a is this term here. And uh, and then uh, if you take the trace, uh, you take S to be an affine parameter, you get this equation, which is a famous Rachadui equation. It's zero on the right-hand side. So uh, this trace sky plays, of course, an important role. Uh, and uh, here uh, is what you do if you want to solve the Kirchhoff sub sobole parameter. Uh, you, you want to solve the wave equation, excuse me. You want to solve the wave equation with an f on the right hand side, uh, initial data equal to zero. And you do exactly the same thing. You look for solutions of the type w times delta of u, where you solve again the iconal equation in, in on your curved space time. Uh, u, the boundary is equal to zero. And uh, uh, just like before, you, you also want to solve the transport equation. So, again, this is something very easy to do. Uh, you find out the W, but now the problem is that uh, you cannot get rid. So you, you get the terms like this, which uh, before, in uh, if you're exactly in flat uh, Minkowski space time, this will give you just a delta at the point P. Uh, so th this this is a usual representation formula, uh, the Kirchhoff uh, formula. While in this case, uh, you have to do something with this term. So what what is being done? Uh, this was done by Hadamar, is uh, uh, introduce uh, infinitely many corrections to get rid of these type of terms. Uh, unfortunately, you need infinitely many corrections. You need infinite, to solve infinitely many transport equations. Every time you solve a transport equation, you use derivative of the metric G. So that's pretty bad if you want to do a nonlinear problem, right? So instead, so this was an observation made by Sobolev in 1936 uh, for solving quasi-linear second order uh, wave equations. Again, unfortunately, you cannot see the the end. That's too bad. Anyway, so uh, so what he did uh, was to stop at this level. 
right? So uh, of course, if if you use uh, if you use this calculation, you get this formula: uh, phi of t is an integral along the light one. So this is exactly like uh, the usual k for formula, but you have an error term which looks like this. So it's a uh, an integral uh, uh, again along the of the boundary, an error term which, as you see, it has a two derivative of trace chi along the boundary. And of course, you can see that you lose derivatives here quite a lot because trace chi depends on on two, on, on on the metric on oh, sorry on the curvature. Uh, therefore, two derivatives of the metric, and you have two more derivatives. You already have four derivatives, and you you start seeing why Ivan Shekepura had to use a lot of derivatives on the initial data. Uh, it's essentially for this reason. So. Uh, so this was uh, Sobolev, which uh, applied this for quasi-linear second order scalar wave equations. So again, I mean, Einstein e vacuum equations uh, gives you a system. So this was the main technical novelty of Yvon choke Brua was to adopt this uh, Kirchhoff-Sobolev formula to the situations where you have systems. So that's, that's what you see here. Uh, so she's treating... <laughs> equations uh, like this. So these are linear. So let's just start with a linear equation. Uh, so for a system, so uh, S can run from one to whatever, one to a hundred. Uh, and you look uh, for solutions again of this form, but this time, obviously, uh, you, you have to have trans, you have to solve systems of transport equations for WS. So U is, Again, a solution of the iconal equation corresponding to, to the metric A lambda mu. This is the Lorentzian metric. So you solve the iconal equation, uh, you, uh, but then you have to solve a system of transport equation where now, because of the shape of, of this equation, you also have to take, take into account the sub principal term, right? So it's not just the second order term, but also this term you have to cancel. So the formulas have to be adapted in such a way that you also get rid of the term. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, and then, of course, uh, Yvonne applies this to quasi-linear wave equations. So this is a most general kind of second-order equations. Uh, you could, in principle, have dependence of the gradient of phi. This is what happens in fluids, in fact. Uh, fluids you have, but of course, for the just Einstein equations, you don't, this, don't need this term, and that's what, in fact, Yvonne, Yvonne did. But her method applies it equally well uh, to the case where you have a derivative of phi here. So as I said, the method requires a derivative on trace chi to be in an infinity. So that means that uh, the curvature has to be in an infinity, two derivative of curvature to be an infinity. You need one more derivative for the linearization and that's what you get the magic number five, which was used by Yvonne in her work, right? So that's basically what explains uh, her work, right? Now, of course, uh, there is another method which is much more efficient from the point of view of local existence, right? So that's the energy method. Uh, the idea, you can see it very easily right here, is that uh, if you just want to solve the same kind of inhomogeneous equation that we saw before by Kirchhoff, you see that you in L2, if you use L2 norms instead of the representation formula, <laughs> the energy, in other words, uh, you see that one derivative of phi depends on F in L2, while before you had that phi depended phi was at the same level as f. Uh, so obviously you gain a derivative here, and uh, but that's not the only advantage of this method. I mean, I remember actually uh, one of the, I had many discussions with Fritz John when I was uh, uh, collaborating with him. And uh, he told me that uh, the most important, he, he, he saw that the most important thing that happened during his lifetime from the point of view of partial differential equations is the fact that they got rid of the characteristics in in treating uh, quasi-linear hyperbolic equations, and uh, uh, in other words, you don't need any representation formula whatsoever. That's a, that's that's a main advantage of, of that, right? As we shall see, actually, <laughs> this was, I mean, exactly at the same time that this happened, uh, Christodoulin and I started to use actually again characteristics in order to do the, the global stability of Minkowski space. So we. I, I, I was joking to Fish John and I said, well, you, you, you know, the best what happened in your lifetime was to get rid of it, we're putting it back. <laughs> so anyway, so, uh, uh, so the, there were uh, pre, before, even before uh, the Yvonne's ACTA paper, there was, there was works by Friedrich Levy in 1928. This is a famous uh, work uh, 
but as you see, it's very limited. Uh, it, it uses energy methods to prove uh, uniqueness and, uh, and uh, domain of dependence of solutions to the initial value problem for linear hyperbolic differential equations, right? So this was, and again, I think it was just scalar in that case. And then Schauder did uh, what I just told you. He, uh, he proved the, the uh, for quasi-linear, this was the initial value problem for quasi-linear hyperbolic equation of second order in any number of independent variables. That's the name of the paper in which uh, he treats using this kirchhoff sobolev idea, he treats uh, uh, scalar equations, right? So again, as I said, y Yvonne deals with systems. So that's that was the main technical uh, difference. Uh, so here are results based on the energy estimates. So there is, of course, uh, uh, Loray introduced. So L Loray uh, had these very, very general uh, lectures on hyperbolic equations, uh, which appeared. So th this is this was not never published, I guess, but you you can find you can find the lecture notes at, uh, at the Institute of Advanced Study. So this was 1952. Um, so uh, there was a problem actually with this one. He he, he uses uh, strict hy strict hyperbolicity, which means that you you have to have eigenvalues which are separated. That does not apply. So this is a condition that does not apply to general system. So in fact, the first time the general systems were treated uh, is in the work of Friedrichs without without this this uh, issues of eigenvalues. The eigenvalues should be different. So this is a uh, Friedrich system, uh, symmetric hyperbolic system. And of course, uh, it applies also to the Einstein equations. You can write down the Einstein equation as a symmetric hyperbolic system and therefore apply uh, Friedrich's uh, method, uh, energy method, and uh, you get various results. So the, the, the first important result is one of Fisher Marsden in 1972. We're using uh, energy estimates in the spirit. Well, it's not, they don't use symmetric hyperbolic system. They have something else due to cut off. But in any case, there is uh, uh, essentially the energy estimate, Sobolev inequality and interpolation allows you to get to three half plus one. So instead of five and, and four, you get now uh, S uh, larger than three. This should be S minus one here, excuse me. And so that should be one less. So, uh, so this was uh, what was done by by the classical theory. Now, to go below uh, this three half plus one, there are uh, results of Rodiansky and myself in 2005, rough solutions of the Einstein vacuum equation, where you can go all the way to as large as N2. So this is, a, this is a result where the gauge condition was, in fact, just the wave gauge condition. So you, you didn't have to uh, dig deeper into the gauge condition. Uh, however, this result, the bounded L2 curvature theorem, which is really the sharpest result that we have today, uh, this is for S equal to two. So this is the result in collaboration with, with Jeremy and uh, Igor Rodiansky. Uh, so the bounded L2 curvature conjecture really goes all the way to S equal to two here. And of course you can, at S equal to two, you have the curvature, so you can express the result in terms of the curvature of the initial data set in L2. So, so this is, uh, uh, however, it's not the best thing that you hope because the critical exponent is S equal to three half. So I'll try to explain a little bit more what's going on. And, and of course, uh, one of the conjecture, unsolved conjecture, and one of the deepest uh, conjectures, I think, in, in uh, connected with hyperbolic equations is really to go to a critical exponent. In, in other words, to get a, uh, an existence result consistent to the critical exponent, which is uh, S equals three half. So you see, you still have a, a half gap to go. This is something really that has to do with quasi-linear equations, I should say from the beginning, maybe I'll mention more later, it has to do with quasi-linear wave equation. And in particular, it has to do with the icon equation because any, any type, you, when, whenever you solve these problems, you cannot do just by energy estimates, you need a representation formula. Representation formula brings back the characteristics as I just mentioned earlier. And the characteristics have problems in terms of uh, how far you can go. In fact, this result is optimal from the point of view of the geometry of characteristics. Okay, so I'll, I'll say a few more words later on. Okay, in any case, let's go to uh, the breakdown criterion. So this is uh, something that clearly is connected with Yvonne's uh, use of 
of the case of Sobolev formula. Uh, so this, uh, there are results on, which we called a breakdown criteria in general relativity, which was improved. So we have a result which was improved by Kian Wang in uh, 2012. Uh, this is a paper, improved breakdown criteria for Einstein vacuum equations in CMC gauge. So the, the result says the following, again, is based on the kirchhoff sobolev formula. Uh, you, you have a, a space time, you have a foliation by CMC or maximal foliation. The metric looks like this, uh, where n uh, is a lapse function. Uh, so assume that uh, for every t, sigma t is maximal or CMC, uh, then the space time can be continued past t equal t star. So let's assume that you, you, you know, you, you have a, re a solution up to t star, as long as uh, this integral of k in an infinity and the gradient of logarithm of the lapse are bounded uh, in an infinity and integrated from zero to t star, as long as this is finite, you can continue the solution. So, so this is very similar to, to uh, uh, Bill Katomaida result for the uh, Euler equations. Excuse me. So any uh, sufficient EHS regularity. So it's, uh, sorry? The, it doesn't really matter. So th this is not a well poisonous result, right? It, it's just that it tells you if the solution is sufficiently smooth and up to the time T star, this is finite, you can continue with whatever smoothness you want. I mean, whatever smoothness you have in the initial data. Right. So, uh, so anyway, so this is the result, and it's based on it, it's based on Kirchhoff Sobolev. Let, let me sort of uh, tell you very roughly how it goes. So this condition star, which was the condition here, uh, allows you to get a first energy estimate for the curvature. You, you show that the curvature is in L two. Uh, then uh, it's easy to show that the, this condition plus the L infinity norm. Of the so I, I I need however to go now to the infinity I cannot use L two anymore. If I control the infinity norm plus this condition, then I can get I can get higher derivative of the curvature. So this is connected with your question. Okay? And uh, uh, but the crucial point is this one is to show that if star is satisfied and I have curvature in L two, then I get this in L infinity. Therefore I get this, and therefore I get uh, I get higher regularity. Uh, so this is a crucial point, and it's it's complicated. It's based on the kirchhoff sobolev formula in the following sense. You write down a wave equation for the curvature of the type on the right-hand side, curvature times curvature. Uh, and then you apply this kirchhoff sobolev type formula a la Yvon Choquebrua, and uh, you get uh, that the curvature, you see, th that's, that's the advantage of the kirchhoff sobolev formula. Because if I, uh, if I would have a derivative of the curvature on the right-hand side here, I would be in trouble, right? So the important thing is that I have I see only the curvature itself. Of course, I see this term, which in principle depends on a lot of derivatives, but but that's the sort of thing that we can finesse. So what we can show is that uh, as long as you con control the curvature flux along the uh, th this uh, null hypersurfaces, uh, we also control the geometry of these null hypersurfaces. In particular, you have to control the radius of injectivity. Because obviously, uh, for this uh, formula to make sense and to be able to apply, I need to have at least a small portion uh, of the space time. Uh, in other words, n, n minus p has to be sufficient. I have to I have to have a lower bound for n, n minus one of p, which means a lower bound of the radius of injectivity. So, so uh, the crucial uh, a crucial uh, geometric thing that comes in here is that just curvature flux along n minus we control the radius of injectivity of these null hypersurfaces plus bounds for this type of terms. Of course, there are some other terms here. I mean, there is it's more it's much more complicated, but uh, but roughly speaking, the main term is this one: the, the two derivative of trace time, right? Right. So so let me let me say a few words about this. Unfortunately, I'm not going to go into the detail, but that's a that's a very long story. So how you show the radius of injectivity? is included in this sequence of papers, which I, I have here. So there is a, a paper in 2005, which is causal geometry of Einstein vacuum space-time with finite curvature flux. So the important thing here is that, of course, there are lots of results in geometry that tell you if the curvature is in an infinity, you control the radius of injectivity. Here, the important point 
is that you can do it with just curvature in L2. So you control the radius of objectivity with curvature in L2. So that's, uh, that's sort of a long story. It's based on these three papers, uh, causal geometry of Einstein about in space time, the kirchhoff sobolev parametrics. So we had to have a more geometric version of kirchhoff sobolev in order to, to really get everything out of it. Uh, and then we, there are some technical things with sharp trace theorem or non hyper surfaces. It's another paper together with Rodiansky. Uh, sorry, this is the same for some reason. Um, uh, okay, then uh, radius of injectivity. So this was, in fact, the last of the, of the series, radius of injectivity. I should say that these papers have been simplified quite a bit in a, in a work by Shao, who was a former student of mine in 2012. Uh, where he gets new tensorial estimates in vessel spaces of time-dependent two plus one dimensional problems. In other words, something that can be used uh, on null hypersurfaces, right? But not null hypersurfaces have exactly two plus one. Yeah, and of course, it's essential that you satisfy the Einstein equations. It will not be true without, so, uh, the Einstein equation it plays a fundamental role. Yeah, absolutely. But but uh, there are lots of very technical things that have to do with trace theorems, with, with very very sharp trace theorems. Anyway, so let me let me go to the bounded there two because the bounded there two uh, is uh, in fact actually uh, is a first point I should make that the bounded there two implies this uh, breakdown criterion, the the sharp breakdown criterion. I mean. I won't have time to show it, but it's not very difficult. It actually, you could see relatively easy. So here, uh, the advantage is that, uh, sorry, uh, here, okay. So the, the advantage is that uh, uh, you uh, have a result, which is also well posed as result. You, you show that the actual equations are well posed. That's, that's different from a breakdown criteria. A breakdown criteria only tells you that under certain conditions, I can extend the solution. This tells you that just starting with initial data of a certain type, I can continue the solution. I, 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 I get a, uh, an existence result based on just the initial data. So this is uh, uh, based, so the, the bounded L2. So again, I, I recall the bounded L2 tells you that uh, all you need is a metric to be in H2 of the initial data and the second fundamental form to be in H1, right? Uh, so how do you do that? I mean, first of all, a gauge condition plays a fundamental role. In fact, you can see that the, I mean, there is a result, in fact, that shows the result of Hans Liebland, and I forgot the other one. Anyway, there, there is a result that tells you that in wave coordinates, this result is wrong. So you, you don't have well posedness in H2, right? So it's a, it depends, it's a result which depends essentially on gauge condition. So the gauge condition that you need is one for which you see what is called the null condition. So you you you, see you have a specific version of the null condition verified in the correct uh, uh, if you have the correct gauge. So the gauge that, that we pick is one which expresses the Einstein vacuum equation, the Young Mills, right? So it's uh, uh, I, I don't think I'll have the time to go through uh, the description of the gauge. It's not too complicated, but in any case, it's one in which you actually see the uh, null conditions verified. I I don't quite I mean I must say. I'm still puzzled by the fact that everybody in the field wants to use wave coordinates. There are so many other coordinates which are better, right? So for example, this one that we use here are much, much better right? because you, you have the null conditions verified. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it has a frame, right? It has a maximum foliation together with the frame. So uh, it works much better. So I don't quite see, uh, but you know, people like uh, wave coordinates, fine, it's okay. but. I... <laughs> Why freeze John? Oh, because it's all hyperbolic equation. <laughs> right. Anyway, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, it's another representation formula that you need, which uses characteristics, but it's a plane wave, unlike the the one that we had before, which is which is based on an alcon. This is a plane wave representation. You see, uh, it's an exponential here, e to the i lambda u w u omega here where u omega verifies the iconal equation. So again, the iconal equation comes in, characteristics are very important in all this. Uh, and uh, uh, once you have this type of represent representation, you get bilinear estimates. So this is where the null condition comes in. 
there is a special structure in these coordinates. The Einstein equations have a special structure, which we can start using by using bilinear estimates. Uh, so, uh, so this there is a proof for bilinear estimates, which is due again to Rodiansky and myself, uh, which is used here. Uh, however, uh, one important point that I need to make uh, is that uh, uh, when you apply these bilinear estimates, you need somehow to look at solutions of wave equations. So you have two wave equations. You have a bilinear form between phi and psi, uh, and uh, you need to represent at least one of these equations using this representation formula, not the second one, which is a great advantage. But that, the second one you can just use a stand, the just energy estimates for it. In other words, you can you can use this equation uh, as it is, uh, but you have to use a plain wave representation for one of them. <laughs> Uh, so what's important, again, is that we need to control the geometry of the level surfaces of u omega. And once more, the reason you cannot go below h2, in principle, you should go below h2, and I'll explain in a moment why. In principle, you should go below h2. The reason you cannot be, go below h2 is because of the, uh, the, you cannot control the geometry of the surfaces u omega below h2. Okay, so h2 is sharp, uh, and it's sharp at the level, uh, right. So I said, Oh yeah, okay, and of course you need to sh to have a sharper estimate for for the fact that, as I said, uh, you represent a solution of this equation by this representation formula. But of course you get an error term. Uh, you have to estimate the error term, and this is very hard. This was done by Jeremy in three, four papers, three papers actually, which had four. Okay, so it's a it's one of the more technical parts of the whole thing, uh, uh, just to show that that uh, this uh, this. You, you you can control these uh, error terms. So uh, I, why did I say that in principle you could go below H2 is because for geometric equations, which have sort of similar structure, but which are not quasi-linear, so which are semi-linear, in other words, for which the metric is a Minkowski metric, you can do much better. And in fact, there are plenty of results now uh, where you, you, you can go all the way to the, the scaling exponent. In particular, in this case, it would be H3 half. So the reason you cannot go to H3 half is because of the quasi-linear nature of the equation. Okay. So that's one of the, they, nevertheless, we have a conjecture, of course, uh, that there has to exist a scaling variant global world Poisson as a result. Why we have such a conjecture? Because we believe in the Einstein equations. Right? Einstein equation is such a wonderful equation. How can it not be true, right? So there has to be one, we don't know what it is. Uh, and this is, I, I think, this is the boundary, in a sense, of what is known in the wake of uh, Yvonne Choquet's Boas work. That's where we are now. We don't have such a result. And obviously, uh, the, the goal of the next generation is to look for such a And of course, this will be this will be very important for, say, cosmic censorship and many other things, right? In particular, I should say that once you go to the critical exponent, of course, you have global existence also. So this is also, this will be also, uh, a, uh, a sharp stability of Minkowski space result, which I'm going to talk about now. So let's talk about stability of Minkowski space. I should say that stability of Minkowski space also has something uh, very important, a very important contribution of, of Yvonne's. Uh, is this paper that really, I remember, obsessed me at the time when I read it, because I was already interested in stability of Minkowski space, that, but there was this funny result Sort of a very short paper. Uh, I think it was also a contra view paper, uh, where uh, Yvonne Chogebra shows that in wave coordinates, uh, you get a logarithmic divergence. Right. So in other words, if you linearize uh, the Einstein equations in wave coordinates, and you look at the first non-trivial iterate, uh, you get a logarithmic divergence in terms of decay. Okay. So you expect decay to be like t to the minus one in in or wave equations in Minkowski space in three plus one dimension, uh, but somehow you get a logarithmic. So th th this is actually the same thing. Uh, this kind of logarithmic divergence, of course, shows up in what Lindblad did later on, where he actually showed that you have ill-posenets exactly in H2. In any case, this uh, this was a, a major uh, uh, presented a major problem, and of course you have to realize that you cannot wa wa use wave coordinates, right? Uh, okay, so anyway, uh, before I, I want to write a, some 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 works which played an important role in stability of Minkowski space, 
uh, there were some results of John. There was my result in 1980, uh, where uh, you get global existence for nonlinear wave equations in sufficiently high dimensions. Uh, the vector field method is something that uh, played a major role in stability of Minkowski space. This uh, started with work of Moravets. Uh, there was some work of uh, John and myself and my work of 1985, uh, which presents a vector field method as a, as a systematic way of getting decay without using the fundamental solution. However, using characteristics, <laughs> right? You don't use fundamental solution, but use characteristics. Uh, so anyway, this is uh, uh, then uh, the null condition. So you need the null condition because there is an example due to Fries John, which is the ambition of phi is dt of phi squared. Equation which doesn't phi is a null condition, and there's a consequence one in which you don't have global solutions uh, even for small initial data. Okay? So that's uh, so you, you you get a logarithmic divergence. Uh, and therefore. To get around this, you need the null condition. And this was something uh, that uh, was done by Mr. Duru and myself, my pa paper in 1982, uh, in which uh, this null condition uh, is expressed as sort of a, a way of getting around uh, difficulties with decay. Obviously, I won't have time to get into it. Uh, and then, of course, there is a paper of 1993, Mr. Duru and myself, the nonlinear gravitational stability of Minkowski space, which is uh, based on various new ideas, uh, a flexible gauge choice, so we don't use the wave coordinates. Sorry, I mean, you hear me many times saying that, but you don't use wave coordinates. Uh, you use a gauge condition, which is much more geometric. Uh, it brings back the use of characteristic, as I just said, because you need optical functions, uh, because optical functions really give you the correct uh, decay uh, for solutions of curvature, let's say. Uh, adapted vector field method. So this is <clears throat> the vector field method. With, with, this, this was done in Minkowski space. Uh, here, of course, you need, you, it's based on killing vector fields, I should say. This vector field method, especially this one of mine, uh, is, is based on killing vector fields in Minkowski space, killing and conformal killing vector fields in Minkowski space. Well, of course, in, in perturbations uh, of Minkowski space, you don't expect to have Keeney vector fields, but you have a way to adapt the vector field method such that the, the deformation tensors of the vector field, you construct vector fields, uh, the deformation of vector fields are sufficiently small so you can control them in perturbations. So, uh, and of course, there is an intrinsic version of the null condition, which is something which is not expressed specifically in terms of solutions of wave equations, but it's sort of intrinsic in the geometric uh, structure of the equation. Okay. Anyway, I, obviously I won't have, I mean, most people already know what this is, so I, I, I'm not going to be able to go into the details. Uh, there is, uh, uh, however, people are not satisfied with this result, so they had to go back to the uh, wave coordinates. So there was, <laughs> but there was a result uh, of uh, Lindbergh and Rodiansky uh, which was a beautiful result, where they showed something that we thought was impossible. Actually, at some point, I realized that it should be possible because of the result of uh, Lindblad. So Lindblad had a, a very important observation in this, uh, which made it possible. But uh, at the beginning, we thought, I mean, when we did this uh, work on stability of Mikoski space, we, we thought that uh, wave coordinates would be impossible because of this logarithmic divergence, which was point out, pointed out by, by Yvonne uh, Choquebois. So what they observe here is that even though the Einstein equations in wave coordinates does not satisfy the null condition, which is important because otherwise you have you, you have counterexamples for global existence, uh, it satisfies something called the weak null condition. Uh, and the weak null condition allows you to get a logarithmic divergence. You get a logarithmic divergence, but somehow, somehow this logarithmic divergence does not change the structure of the global solution. So it's a, it's a slightly more complicated asymptotics, but nevertheless, you can, you can, you can do it. Uh, there were many other results in the, in the wake of, uh, of our result, many, many other results uh, in vacuum. My work with Nicolo, for which uh, deals with the exterior problem. Uh, of course, uh, what I just said, Lindvar Rodniansky in 2005, Bieri in 2008, 
Uh, she rela relaxes the initial conditions which were needed in our work on Sabetio Mikoski space. She gets a much better result. You need much weaker decay for the initial conditions. This was later, I mean, recently actually, improved by Shen, which really gets an amazing result in terms of decay. Uh, so that's uh, 2023. Uh, there is a result of Huno, which uh, really uh, treats the Einstein equations in two dimensions, which is much harder from the point of view of decay because there is less decay. Uh, there is a uh, hinz uh, which uses uh, uh, their favorite method to, to get the decay, which is different from ours. Uh, Actually, they still use. I mean, you. I guess you still use. Uh, you still use the vector, some kind of vector field method, the, the energy method, of course. Okay. Uh, then uh, there is graph, which which does the space-like characteristic data, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, again, the conjecture here is that there must exist a scaling variant version of stability of Minkowski space. So this is connected to this bounded. What I said earlier about the bounded there too. You want to go all the way to. Uh, if you can go all the way to a critical exponent. Then you you also have a global uh, stability of Minkowski. Yes. So the second result uh, about differential D, does he need more to get this? Uh, no, in this this is for the K minimal. Right, but he has the same differentiability. Differentiability, yeah, it doesn't. Yes, much much derivative. Uses one derivative. Sorry, and uses one derivative. Right. Yeah, but the, the, but the main the main you that uses the uh. Okay, so then uh, th there are, okay, so this is a conjecture again, which I think it's extremely important. Uh, and we know very little about it, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, for Einstein equations with matter, there are many, many uh, beautiful results. There is Zipster in 2009, which treats the Einstein-Maxwell equation, Le Flochma and Kian Wang uh, for the einstein kaplan reduce klein gordon equation, Lindblad, and Taylor uh, and uh, the Fachman, Judio, Mulevich, and Taylor in 2020 uh, for doing uh, Einstein Vlasov equations, coupled with Einstein Vlasov equation. Ionescu Pausa there doing again uh, Einstein Klein Goddard equation, but from a more Fourier method point of view. Uh, and there, there is this beautiful result that we just heard yesterday. Uh, by uh, Zoe, which is uh, on Kaluza Clyde. I guess this, yeah. Anyway, so that's uh, that's uh, uh, as far as global stability uh, is concerned. How many? How much more time I have? Five minutes. So let let me start. I I want to talk about formation of sharp surfaces, but let me let me get over this instability of naked singularity. That's uh, another beautiful. Uh, Beautiful subject uh, connected with cosmic censorship uh, and work of Christodoulou. I want to talk a little bit about some work of now on, but I won't have time. Uh, so let me let me go to stability of care and talk a little bit about stability of care. So at least as an introduction to to Jeremy's talk. So uh, so the conjecture everybody knows. The conjecture uh, is that uh, for any uh, parameters A and M, uh, sub-extremal, uh, you, you, uh, a small perturbation of a case solution leads to another case solution. And the theorem that uh, we have proved recently, uh, the main result was Jeremy uh, in 2021, based on uh, a few other papers, in particular the GCM papers about which Jeremy will talk about, which play a fundamental role. Uh, and uh, uh, also uh, a work of uh, Shen. Uh, and finally, uh, the last paper of the series, uh, which is uh, in collaboration with, with Elena Georgi in 2022. So uh, I, I just want to say a little bit, given non-revisionist, I hope, history of the subject, uh, I guess you, you heard a, some, a slightly revision is from Monday, so. Uh, first of all, uh, the discovery of care in 1963, so I'll go very fast about the, the most important step. I, I want to stress that somehow this result that we've proved, and we are very happy that we're able to, so to, to get this result uh, 
at the conclusion, but it, it really is based on the uh, on the work of many, many other people. Uh, so it, it's really a collective effort as far as I'm concerned. So in particular, there is a there is a work done by physicists in in sort of the golden era of uh, mathematical physics. Uh, Reggie Wheeler, Teukowski equation, which played a, a very important role. Uh, Reggie Wheeler is what is called what is known under the name of metric perturbations of Genshaw equations. Teukowski, uh, which corresponds to the curvature perturbations, which is the, the point of view that we adopt. We do things from the point of view of curvature perturbations. Uh, Chandrasekhar transformation in uh, in uh, 1975. So this was a method, this was an, a, a remarkable observation of Chandrasekhar that connects these two things, the metric perturbation to the curvature perturbation. There is a wor work of Whiting. Uh, I mean, essentially all these things which were done here were done in the name of proving some kind of stability, but they were the physicists were only able to do stability for mod. So you have to decompose the equations. First of all, they do the linearized equations. They always do the linearized equation. They decompose in mods. And then they showed mod stability. They showed that the mods are not exponentially growing. So that's more or less uh, the main result of the series was the one of Whiting in 1989. Uh, there is a, an improvement by Anderson, Hefner, and Whiting in 2022. So, so this was one major part uh, in the proof of stability of care. Uh, and again, this was done to a large extent done by, by physicists. Global stability of Nikovsky space. So this is the next important step. Uh, so this will introduce the vector field method, which is of course used uh, in stability of care. Uh, and the null condition, which is also of course used. Uh, otherwise you will not be able to, to have anything uh, global. Uh, so uh, then there is a, a, a period in which many mathematicians have contributed. So this, this is uh, starting more or less since 2003 was the work of Sofer. So this was remarkable because it completely changed the way we thought about the problem. We were trying, up to that point, people were trying, mathematicians were trying to use the physicist approach uh, based on, on decompositions. And, uh, and uh, this was sort of a, a major change with Sofer. And then there were many others, Blue and Sofer, Blue Sturbans, the famous Wojniansky, uh, Ma Metcalf, Petar, and Tohanianu. There were important contributions by all these people. Uh, so this was a case a equal to zero, in other words, Schwarzschild. The, and again, I should say it's it's a study of the wave equation. I should have said from the beginning. So this is a study of the wave equation on a fixed Schwarzschild. And you know, it's quite remarkable that this problem by itself is very very hard. And you know, we didn't have good results until this ones. Uh, for a less than m, in other words, in care, there were work by uh, Dafermos Wodniansky, uh, Tataru Tohanianu, and Anderson Blue. In particular, Anderson Blue plays a very important role in our work. So, because we actually follow the method which was pioneered by Anderson Blue. Uh, there was, uh, for A uh, less than M, it's a work of uh, Afermos Rodiansky and Schopenhauer Rothman. So this is still for just a scalar wave equation. Uh, of course, what you use in, in uh, stability of care, you have to use the Tokolsky equation, which is a spin two type wave equation. And this was uh, work done between 2016 and 2019. A crucial, uh, a crucial work here is the work of Daphne Mosfoltzegger and Rodniansky for A equal to zero, which played a very, very important role. Uh, and then uh, for, uh, so this was still in Schwarzschild. In CARE, there is a work of Ma, Daphne Mosfoltzegger and Rodniansky. Uh, and then uh, there is uh, uh, the work, I mean, uh, the work of uh, uh, Sapir Rothman and uh, Da Costa, Teorita, uh, and uh, a similar one uh, of Millet. I mean, similar, I should say, the results in linear theory. It's very hard to compare results in linear theory because in linear theory, it's very easy to declare victory when you prove something, right? Now, uh, okay, anyway, so there is a, uh, the, there are also results of the full linear stability. Again, Dafer Mohotz and Rodniansky is the first type of result. Though I, I should say, again, it's very important to really understand what linear stability means. For example, this result does not prove the correct decay as far uh, as you need for the nonlinear equation. Uh, there is a, uh, again, for a 
much less than n, there is a work of uh, Bagdar, Blue, Ma, and Hintz and Vasi. Uh, and I'll finish with this one. So uh, there is a nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild. So the first major result for nonlinear stability is the one that uh, the, uh, <coughs> Seftel and myself proved in 2019. We had to make an assumption of, of polarization. People make a lot of it. Uh, lots of people would think that this was a major uh, uh, restriction. It is a restriction, uh, but it's not major. Uh, and uh, anyway, a lot of the future uh, results, in particular the GCM spheres and hypersurfaces that uh, Jeremy will talk about, are really already developed in this case. Uh, and they are also used in the next uh, result, which is the uh, Fermo Holtz against Ronyansky and Taylor in 2021. Uh, where instead of polarization, they use another type of condition, which is a co-dimension three uh, condition. Uh, and uh, so these are the works that Jeremy are going to is going to talk about it. And finally, the normal instability uh, of rotating curve, which I already mentioned. So let me finish. Uh, once again, I want to express my, my gr gratitude for you guys to organize this conference. It, it's really a wonderful thing to do for Yvonne. So thank you. It's a wonderful uh, thing of you to give this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um.